want this paper somewhere else so you don't see it or you um, you don't I'm shooting it pretty tight so I don't see it okay there. could you back it off a little bit <laughs> it's not an HD TV is it could you just back it off a little bit it looks pretty good. do you have that filter that maybe you can put on there that youth filter we'll use some software later. okay <laughs> all right it's amazing what he can do and, and he knows right where I live I mean he lives right behind me on City Park so yeah. we ready yeah okay we're here for one of our oral history interviews, and we are delighted to have with us Jerry Esselstyn. Thank you. And Jerry, uh, you're one of those folks that can claim lifelong residency in German Village. Yes, sir. When, what year were you born? 1950. Yeah, I would have liked to just said, you know, last century, but I, I'll go with 1950. That's all right. Tell us about growing up in German Village. First, about your folks. Okay. I, I gather they uh, lived a long time here as well. <laughs> Mom passed away at 88, my dad at 92. Uh, my mom lived in German Village all her life. She was born down here. My father came from Perry County. He was a carpenter, construction superintendent. And I didn't know life other than Jaeger Street until after graduating from OU. And we've, Lynn and I, married in 73, have lived on 3rd Street, exactly 857 at the corner of Lansing and 3rd for the last 40 years. And both your sets of parents, uh, you and Lynn, were Germanic? No, I'm, I'm the 100% German. We're not sure what Lynn is. Okay. She's from Pittsburgh. She loves the village. I remember when we got married, she said, how long do I have to live here before we can move out? Because she was a suburban kid in Pittsburgh. And uh, she was here about two years, and she goes, we don't have to move. I believe you said your folks moved here sometime around 1913, 1915. Was the fact that this was a German area of attraction to them when they moved here? Well, my grandmother on mom's side lived here in German Village. So mom was born in the area and never left. She was born in 1915, and my dad was born in 1913. So would it have been your grandmother who was first generation? Uh, That's my guess. Okay. But I'm not the historian when it comes to her. Yeah. Sure. Well, now, what, where were you uh, living initially when you... Were born here in Columbus. Where was your 808 Yeager Street. Okay. And uh, I think I have a birth certificate from Mount Carmel West. I'm not 100%. Yeah, I'm 100% sure of that. Went to St. Mary's for 12 years. Uh, the new, the then new building on 3rd Street in 1956. I was in the first, first grade. I jokingly tell people I was in the first grade, first, first grade, second, second grade. The math went on. And I was the last, in the last class to graduate from St. Mary's High School. 1968, due to height, I was literally the last person to graduate from St. Mary's High School. My mom graduated from St. Mary's, and my two older sisters both graduated from St. Mary's. What was it like going to St. Mary's? Well, I loved it. And most of my memories are really around grade one through eight. Uh, in the high school, when I was a freshman, there were four classes. When I was Sophomore, there were only three, and a junior, there was only two. And when I was a senior, we were in a class by herself, class of 72, because they were consolidating the high school into Worley, down on Parsons Avenue. So high school was a little diminished as far as population and activity. Grade school, though, my fondest memory is I walked home for lunch eight years in a row. Never missed a lunch. Got a great education. Got a great education. Uh, walked home for for lunch every day. Stay at home mom, which is I'm not saying whether that's good or bad. I'm just saying she was home every day for lunch. The grade school was in the building that's now going to become a private home. That was the high school. Okay. That was the high school, and there was there's a second building behind the one that's going to become the private home, and then there was a third building on the property which has since been destroyed it was a frame property and so everything was kind of consolidated into there when I went to high school we even had a uh, double wide trailer on the parking lot for a while I remember that because that's where I took Latin not my favorite subject uh, <laughs> but uh, the memories of grade school growing up in the neighborhood parents involved it, you know it makes a difference I was thrilled last week when I heard that when Stewart re reopens, they're going to allow for part of that school to be a neighborhood concept. I just think that's phenomenal. 
Now, you grew up in an era when there were a lot more kids in German Village than there are presently. I'm going to answer that yes, and then I'm going to put an asterisk by it, because we walk so much around the village, Lynn, Lynn and I, that if we see strollers and we see young people, and I can tell you within 10 properties in either direction of my house, we got young friends. And I think it's changing. They, they want to figure out how to stay in German Village and raise kids. And I did it, but it cost a lot of money. You know, my kids went to private school, and I feel blessed that I could make that happen, but we got to figure out how to keep kids and young parents growing up in the village. Jerry, I'd like to have you tell us a little bit what it was like growing up in German Village. First of all, you mentioned Schiller Park was not a place that uh, you were allowed to uh, play on. Schiller Park was an area where my father said, don't go to Schiller Park. And the times I tested that, two bad things happened. One, it was proven to me why I shouldn't go to Schiller Park. It was a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say violent, but you, if you went with a bike, you could walk home. You know, if you went over to fish, you could leave without your fishing pole. You just kind of got picked on a little bit. Uh, so, and then when your father found out you actually went to Schiller Park, that was, well, that was worse. Double than, whammy. Double whammy. Uh, but Schiller Park now is, my memory of Schiller Park's phenomenal. What they've done with the park, the lighting, the gardens. Living so close to the park on 3rd Street, growing up, you know, raising my two kids, I always said that's our backyard. We, play, we played in Shore Park. Your kids, uh, Alex and Andrea? Alex and Andrea. Alex is 32, living in Chicago now. I think I mentioned earlier, downtown. Andrea, I'm not allowed to say her age, but she's a year younger than Alex and lives in Cleveland. They're both working. You know, Lynn and I joke, we worked so hard to raise them to be independent. Now I'm not sure we, we're glad we did, but uh, they're doing well. But you may mentioned to me that they most, must both have enjoyed urban living because they're doing that now. Alex has told me on numerous occasions he wants to duplicate his bedroom whenever he has a house. And they talk they love to come back to German Village. And my daughter was just in this past weekend. We had to have dinner at Lindy's on the patio, of course. Of course. Uh, so there's always an itinerary when they're in town is what they're going to do. And most of it really centers around German Village. And when they went to school, they had a lot of pride in bringing their classmates to German Village for events or a party at the house. You mentioned they were involved in activities here in German Village when they were youth. They were, in their youth, they were involved through the parish with St. Mary's. Uh, we got them involved with Shore Park. Uh, I, you know, I don't know whether this will appear on tape, but I'm so proud of this. My, my daughter was a, a very good basketball player, and she started in first or second grade over in the Schiller Leagues. And I remember it was either fifth or sixth grade on the co-ed team she was not only the only female, she was the only Caucasian. And she says that was one of her best basketball experiences, and she, she made a lot of friends. So I believe working through, seeing the diversity at Schiller, living in a neighborhood where I'll say it's very eclectic. Is that a safe term? You know, we all bring something, we all bring something unique and different, and. Uh, we don't get pigeonholed based on net worth or accomplishments. We're a community, and I love that. I think that's the greatest gift I gave my two kids. You're uh, old enough to remember German Village pre the construction of the interstate. Pre the construction, yes. And how was, how, and, and there was a market that you... The Mohawk Market. The Mohawk Market, I believe, if I got my boundaries right, it was right on 4th Street. Close to where the bus station is. Right. Between the bus station and here, the Mohawk Market area, and at least once a week, we would walk from Jaeger Street with a couple baskets and sacks, and we go to the Mohawk Market area. And that was fun. That was fun. That was an event. And it, it truly, I can see visual pictures of walking through there. My neighbor had a uh, store there at the Mohawk Market area. Uh, it was just it was just a great time. That was an event we would do. You mentioned your mother didn't even get her driver's license until she was in her fifties. There was right. a lot more walking taking place. Well, we didn't know any other way but walking, and uh, I think that's paid tribute to their health. You know, my dad was known as the German Village Walker for years. 
I think he retired at 62, had some heart issues. And uh, I think he's still known around the village on his path that he would take twice a day. I, it, that's what we did. That's how we got there. And you can, you think that's still important today to, the great thing about German Village is you walk everywhere today. It, it, the community to live here between having, well, a Giant Eagle, a Kroger's, we can even walk to Hills Market. That's, we walk to the North Market, which a lot of people consider that to be a hike. Uh, we're at least having a destination to the commons once a week, seeing the apartments build up. You know, they got the food truck Thursday, different events that we'll walk down and see. I think Lynn's got the weekend plan for a couple events on the commons we're going to walk by. Uh, the Scioto Mile is a destination that we walk to. But I like knowing I can park the car, and if I choose not to move it, there's about every single thing I want within walking distance in the village. But it's a community. You get to know people, even if you don't know them by name, you know them by sight. You know, there's always the nod, there's always the hi. Right. I think people look out for each other. We're blessed right where we live. As I said, third, three generations right next door to me, right across Lansing is three generations, the Michaels family. Uh, the couple behind us on City Park they moved into their house uh, months before we moved in in 73 and has been there the entire time. Caddy Corner to us, they've been there the last 15, 16 years. A lot of stability, a lot of, a lot of support. And we got to put up with John, who just lives a couple streets away. I want to make sure you got on. Thank you very you much. You got Our your plug. Our videographer, plug John Clark, is here and taking this stoically. <laughs> <laughs> and John's going to edit this down to about 10 seconds of worthwhile comments. You, back to your folks for a minute, I was intrigued when you mentioned that uh, even back when you were a youth, there were still a lot of neighborhood groups. You mentioned the something. Uh, the Cosset. Jaeger Civic The Cosset and Jaeger Civic Association. Well, it was, as my dad would say, it's a good excuse on Friday night to get together and play cards and drink beer. And... I don't know the address of the place on 6th Street, but it butt up to the alley, which was just a stone's throw from our house, and we'd meet in the garage. And I, my job was to keep opening beers and deliver them to people at the card tables. Is that, is that legal? Anyhow, that's what I did. That's what I remember growing up. You uh, were a young man when the society started and the commission and what's generally been regarded as the kind of the rebirth of Jersey right. Village. Um, I, I think we discussed the fact that uh, that probably helped a lot in preventing people from moving from this area to the suburbs. I clearly remember my father on a regular basis saying, we got, let's move, the house is too small, I had two older sisters, we had one bathroom, mom always saying, I love the South End. My mom lives here. You know, that tug of war, I remember that tug of war vividly. Uh, in 1960, when I was 10, I remember talking about German Village, the society, uh, seeing the house's work start. And as I said earlier, my father was a construction guy. Right. A and I do believe to Monsignor Berkeley, back at St. Mary's, he was probably the, the best non-Catholic consultant that the parish had on construction matters, and he was intrigued by the renovation. And I think German Village let him buy in that we were going to stay in the neighborhood. And then the 30 years he lived after retirement, I don't think you could have pried him out of here. Yeah, he loved it. He walked. He was, he was a friend to so many people in the neighborhood. And you too became involved in civic affairs. I think you said Mary Louise Hendricks got you involved. Mary Louise Hendricks was my cousin. She lived three or four doors up the street on 3rd Street. And I remember early on in my late 20s, there was a vacancy on the society board. And I don't remember why there was a vacancy, but due to her political influence, I, I fulfilled that vacancy slot for a couple years. Due to career and kids and a few other things, I couldn't continue, but that's my claim to fame for the society. And with, this was a point in time 
before this meeting house was available. So before the meeting house, before the old one that now it was over Tom on Gross house. the Gro that Tom Gross so lives this there. This is just the little home that was the original society right. home on Third Street. Right. And what were meetings like in that facility? They were exactly like the meetings were today. Everyone had an opinion. Everyone got to voice it. Uh, I think we had, you know, of course you had Frank Fetch. Uh, so we had a few dominant personalities that kept herding the cats all in the right direction. But I think through diversity, discussion, disagreement, we always get a better product. Now, was Frank still around when you served on the society board? Yes. And what do you recollect from his involvement? Oh, he was, you know, I, I got a visual picture of him. My mom loved him. And I, he, you never questioned his motives. You just never questioned him. He always took, he always took the high ground. He always took the common ground. And he made decisions on, based on what he thought was good for everyone, not good for him. He was a pretty decisive guy, from my understanding. He would, you know, I like to, I'll maybe refer to the, Truman concept. I'll listen to everybody, but eventually I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. The buck was going to stop with yeah, him. Yeah. So he had a lot of respect. A lot, tons of respect. And I take it in, in uh, your life here, you had to have encountered two other great personalities, Fred and Howard? Fred and Howard, well, <laughs> Fred Holdridge and I probably I argued with him more than any authority in the village, whether it was buses on Third Street, whether it was putting in those godforsaken flowering, are they plums or pears or whatever on Third Street. So I had my discussions with Fred, but a lot of respect. And as you can see that the buses are on Third Street and the trees are in, I lost every argument. <laughs> he was an influential guy. He was an influential guy. You mentioned uh some of the advantages of this neighborhood as, as you've seen it develop and what's so great about it. Tell us your feelings about that. Uh, that's probably the hardest thing to describe. Uh, talking to Lynn in preparation for this discussion, by the way, she said, I've lived here 41 years, why don't they interview me? We should. And, we and, and I told her just the fact you live with me 41 years, this probably clouded every memory you have of the village. The, the biggest thing for me is that I can't imagine loving a house more than the house we built. You know, we built it over time. We put money in it when we had no money. Uh, we took loans on it when loans were hard to get. And today we look back and we love it. Uh, it was painful for me three years ago. That, the original part of that house was built in 1870. And the original 1870 slate roof was on that house till three years ago. And for the last 20 years, I had to baby every slate, and I had to put stick them under it, and one would break and crack and get a replacement. So 10 years, and I figured I was too old to do that anymore. I was going to fall through the doggone thing. So we put a new slate roof on it three years ago. That was painful for me. I'm glad I did it, but it was painful. The historical part of it really means a lot to me. Both short-term history, meaning with the kids and growing up and what we've accomplished there, and then just the history of the neighborhood. You've, uh, this community is somewhat unique in the fact that it was one of the early uh, areas in which there was actual regulation of historic architecture, right. and I believe you feel that's had a, a real effect positively on property value. Oh, absolutely. Talk about that. Well, yeah, I'll use the name Mike Rosen because he was on the commission for 150 years, 300 years, I don't know. He was on there a long time. Uh, going before the commission for the additions that I performed on my house. Uh, frustrating, time consuming, and I never really complained about it. And the reason is, going back to my father in construction, you know, if you can't afford to do it right, how in the hell are you going to pay to do it again? And I think the putting justice, uh, putting the restrictions on it, it allowed the neighborhood and the value to sustain. And I, I totally believe that. Now, I know this won't appear on tape, but walking around Schmitz last night, seeing what they've done to that property behind Schmitz, I want to go, what were they thinking? You know that you should walk by and see that house if you haven't. I know the house. Oh my God! There's a. 
I know that it pained me. It pained me to see that that house. So, but it reminds me of what it means to have guidelines and people committed to following the guidelines. You know, if you have a lot of rules, people want to break them. If you have guidelines and a culture of compliance, you know, I don't want to do anything wrong. I want it to work. Another thing that won't appear is when I put on my new copper gutters with the copper downspouts, I've now lost both of them. But that's another point. <laughs> kind of live a little defensively at times. Jerry, uh, tell us about uh, any other experiences with the society, any of their activities that have been meaningful to you as you've uh, lived here? Well, the, the uh, early on I was involved in ticket sale. I remember when the tickets to the you know, the, the home tour, the, or the, garden tour. the garden, well, the house tour. Right. I remember when those tickets were $4. And I remember all the squawking when they went from four to five. But it was easier to make, obviously easier to make we, change we on a five than a we, four. We interviewed Bill Wenke this morning. He said the first year was a dollar. So yeah, well, see, he, but, well, when you see him, you can tell him he's older than me. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> or his memory is better. So, you know, we, we try to stay involved in, in the social fabric of what's going on in the village. And I think now, you know, the, I'm not retired yet. I think I'm working hard and I got a lot of responsibilities, but I'm looking forward to being more involved. What I have read about the Village Connection and what that group is trying to do in, in helping people live in their homes yes. uh, and having lived through, you know, as I said, my parents, 88, 92, being blocks away uh, I don't know how I got through that without my wife, Lynn, helping them just live in their house. I, I, this village connection thing really intrigues me. And uh, whether I'm part of that or part of something else in the village, you know, I try to help my neighbors now. And I'm getting to the age where they're saying, what do you need me to do? So it's working both ways. Well, it is an area where everybody helps oh, one another. It's, a, it's perfect. It is absolutely perfect. Well, let me just conclude by this. You, you speak with great sentiment about German Village. What has is, what is living here meant to you over the years? I, I think it's uh, self-fulfillment. I think it's self-actualization. I've never, never apologized for living here. I'm proud of living here. I'm proud to bring clients and friends from other communities to You're German CPA, Village. Right? I'm a CPA. I'm very very active in the CPA profession. I'm past president of the society. I've been on the accountancy board, uh, AICPA board of directors. Very proud to bring people to my home, the neighborhood, invite them to share events. When they, they come into town, the first thing they say is, well, will I have a place to park? I said, yeah, we'll get you a place to park. Yeah, you'll be safe. Yes, we'll get you home. We'll get you back to Dublin in time. Uh, but uh, when they're down here, they, they sense a magic. And, and lastly, uh, if, you, if you walk by our house, and I think John will attest to this, uh, we have a lot of plants. Now, whether we have the right plants or the right landscape, they're all green, they're all fed, and they take a lot of love and care to keep them that way through the summer. I cannot be on 3rd Street working in the front of my house without someone pulling over and asking me, Where's Schmidt's? Where's the book loft? Where's Lindy's? And my favorite question is when they walk up and they go, could you tell me where German Village is? <laughs> or German Town. Or German Town, yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me where German Village is? So it's, it's almost impossible on 3rd Street. I must look like I have a friendly face. I want to stop and ask questions. Or they go, boy, you're old. You must know where you're going here. This weekend, uh, couple people walked by and said, where are all the shops? People told us we had to come to German Village for the shops. Tough question, because we're so, we're so laid out, but tried to help them through a couple, couple spots. They did say, is there a transportation that can roam us around German Village? And I, I had to answer no, but I thought, boy, wouldn't it be great if we had something flowing around German Village? A lot of people don't walk as well to the village as they could, so. That was, that was the thought of the weekend. Well, Jerry, thank you. This has been very enlightening, and you're a great advocate for German Village. Oh, I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Right. I appreciate being, being asked. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank Thanks. you.